I don't like talking to politicians, but Ron Paul, he's different. He's the founder of much of our movement. He was talking about free markets and limited government long before I had a clue how important they were. In 2007, ABC aired a long interview I did with Paul. That's what freedom is all about, trusting that individuals can make better choices than government can make for us. Now, 15 years later, we talk again. You fought for liberty for a long time. You ran for president three times, once as a libertarian, twice as a Republican. You lost, but did you make progress? I guess I'm not going to be the judge of that. I don't feel badly about it. Uh, you know, that first one was a, a pretty weak campaign in a conventional sense with the Libertarian Party. Uh, and, and I knew about that, but I wanted to get a message out even when I ran for Congress, my main goal was getting a message out. So it depends on how you measure it. Uh, people who would measure my success in Washington is a total failure. Uh, you know, he, uh, he had no power. He, he really didn't pass much legislation. I got some attention on the monetary issue and other things and the war issue. But uh, since that wasn't my goal, uh, I don't know. Somebody else will have to judge that. Yes, it was a very, very beneficial effort that I made uh, over the years. Your goal was just to get people to finally think about freedom? So I've been thinking about that since the 60s. So that was uh, before the Libertarian Party and uh, before a lot was happening. But I was introduced to the Libertarian ideas. So, uh, yeah, I thought about it. My efforts were precipitated into doing something. Uh, on August 15, 1971. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. And that had to do with the Bretton Woods Agreement because I became fascinated with the monetary issue. And there were predictions by the Austrian free market economists in the 60s that the Bretton Woods, this artificial system of uh, the gold being you know, supported at $35 an ounce, and we would have a reserve currency in the world, there were predictions it wouldn't work. On August 15th, they collapsed and introduced this age of fiat currency. So and that's what I've been talking about a lot. But money issue touches every aspect of liberty. So if you're inclined to think that we're in too many wars, what well, has to do with the Fed? There wouldn't be the wars if they couldn't just print the money for it. If they had to borrow the money from the people, uh, there would be a lot less wars. In welfare states, so many problems we have wouldn't exist if you didn't have that system. That's one of the reasons why I became fascinated with the whole issue of monetary policy. The first time you ran as a libertarian, you got a half percent of the vote. Then as a Republican, 5%. And then the second time, 10%. So I thought he's on, the, <laughs> he's on his way. Libertarianism is gonna keep growing because it's the only system that makes sense. Once I stopped being a leftist and learned about free markets. I thought if I just explain it to people, everybody will get it, but they don't. No, but I think that's the way the world works. I mean, I think the people who think seriously about an issue and may even change their mind like, uh, like you did, that you're in a rare category, and, uh, but you're an opinion maker and you're a thought leader and that means you're going to just be talking to a narrow group of people. Uh, but that narrow group of people have a lot of power and authority, and it becomes uh, democratized when that turns into what we're facing today is we're seeing real democracy. And that is when the people say, you know, that John Stossel was right. Libertarianism is good. And we should resist all this authoritarian stuff. And now we can see tens of thousands of, of people not lining up to go to war, but lining up to restore their liberties that were taken from them unnecessarily. 15 years ago, when you were running for president, I interviewed you on ABC. Here's a clip. What should government do? Protect our freedoms, have a strong national fence, look and take care of our borders, have a sound currency. Today, government does much more than that. Somebody might conclude, well, there's been no success, but I, I'm an optimist because I think there's been a lot of success, but not in Washington, D.C. You can't measure anything up there other than the fact that you realize how much is needed in the area of ideas. 
But I would say the libertarian message is much stronger. When I went to Washington, nobody used the word libertarianism and uh, nobody was caring about the uh, Federal Reserve. Today, a lot of people are talking about the Federal Reserve and what's going on. And uh, people know what the word libertarian means. The ideas are alive and well, but uh, it's still, it's hard to measure. If it's the only measurement is the U.S. Congress, uh, we're not going to see that happen. Matter of fact, the people in Congress right now, the large majority, have nothing to do with the progress in the world. For instance, I work closely with the Mises Institute. I think it's uh, groups like that that are teaching young people and uh, influencing young professors in universities that teach uh, you know, the right kind of economics. I think there's uh, so much more of that now. So no, I think that uh, on the short run, uh, you can see some successes, but I think on the long run, there's a lot more people who understand and want to know more about Austrian economics, but they, we still are outnumbered by those who just blindly uh, look to all the Keynesian economic theories that are completely wrong, but they're failing too. So the failure of these systems that has been around a long time, you know, there's a battle going on. What are you going to replace it with? Most people agree it's not working. And that's why you see a bunch of Marxists marching around Washington. They see this as an opportunity, but we should see it as an opportunity to, to offer an alternative, which makes a lot more sense. And when I interviewed you, you were very popular with young people. Suddenly you are this hot candidate with kids. You're the most Googled, you're big on the internet. Do you know what that's about? Young people tend to be more principled and they welcome the idea of uh, somebody that talks about uh, leaving them alone, letting them run their own lives. I think people are realizing this country is bankrupt and we have to do something. It's not working, so they're looking for some solutions. But what happened to that energy? Because today they get excited about people like Bernie Sanders. Most young people say they prefer socialism to capitalism? Well, because there are more socialist professors, but I still go to the campuses now. I still get a pretty nice reception. Young Americans for Liberty, you know, uh, works with a young people group. And it may be changing because I haven't been doing as much in the last year or two. Uh, maybe the attitudes are changing. But uh, overall, whether it was, uh, you know, before I was in, uh, when I was first in Congress, uh, but nobody knew my name. If I went to the college campus, I'd get 15 or 20 people. As it went, you know, the presidential campaign, I got large crowds out, and I haven't been doing that. But we reach a lot of people, you know, with our Liberty Report, and uh, we don't know how many people they reach. And I think there's a remnant of people out there that uh, cling to knowing the truth. And uh, you appeal to it just like a lot of others. And that, I think, is expanding. I think there are a lot more people who care about honest money uh, today than they did 30 years ago. And that has to happen if they're going to accept the fact that we have to have monetary reform because eventually the people are going to wake up and say, oh, you know, right, right now we're going through the period of time that's so common throughout history. When they print too much money, prices go up, which we would expect, and then the people come to the government and says, uh, oh, uh, I need more money. I can't pay my bills. Well, that's crazy because it was too much money created out of thin air is the problem. But eventually it has to come. I want more purchasing power to my money and do away with the debt. They have to be taught this. Maybe they all just come to our website or something. But I, I, I think there's people out there uh, and, and I challenge people that if you have an audience of uh, high school kids and, and an honest uh, audience of people with inquiry, I think they're receptive uh, to their personal liberties. And, and sometimes it was on civil liberties. I would get uh, you know, a better approach when I went to the campuses when I talked about civil liberties. They like to be left alone, but they have to be responsible. Now, I think your question is, is that all gone? I don't think so. I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a reflection of the unbelievable control by the mass media and all the silly stuff that the government passes out. Let's talk about wars. You've always opposed foreign wars. But after 9-11, you supported going into Afghanistan. I voted for that authority to go after those responsible for 9-11 
I was very unhappy with what happened because we neglected to pursue Osama bin Laden. That did not mean that they had the authority uh, to occupy and try to transform Afghanistan, which is a problem that is, has not gone away yet. It's, it's going to be growing. Uh, that is a perpetual problem for us because we did not uh, do what we were supposed to do. You wanted America to go to Afghanistan, find and capture or kill the people responsible, and then get right out. My biggest beef on that whole thing was that uh, I was on the uh, committee and I said, you're giving authority, it's open-ended. And I said, if you uh, uh, are given the authority, uh, what you should do is declare war, you know, and, and not pretend. So yes, I think if, uh, if you were going to do that, and matter of fact, they did go in and uh, I think one incident uh, was uh, pretty strange, and that was at Tora Bora. The U.S. Okay. is sending between two and 300 commandos and intelligence officers into the mountains where Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda fighters are making what could well be their last stand. They had bin Laden cornered, and yet all of a sudden, you know, he was in Pakistan. And I can remember, I don't know how many years it was, oh, there are a good many years, and I'm on record as saying, you know, what are they doing this in uh, Afghanistan? Bin Laden you know, was sort of allowed to go and go. He went into into Pakistan and he was there for a long, long time. And uh, so I always wonder, wonder, wonder how they let him go. <laughs> don't don't we have a pretty strong army? And that lasted for a long, long time. So it's uh, <clears throat> it's unfortunate that we don't follow the rules. If we have an enemy <clears throat> and people think we should go to war, it should be a vote by Congress not to do whatever, to give the power to the president to do whatever he wants, is so for the president to have a prescribed role of declaring war and winning it and getting out. But that's exactly what never will happen. I remember in 1976, when I first went to Congress, I was on a radio interview with another Democrat, and this, this subject came up. And, uh, and the Democrat, who had been around a long time, he was experienced, and he, was, he wanted to lecture me a bit, and he did. He says, well, he says, that sounds good and damn And he predicted, he says, you will never see a declaration of war in this country again. Uh, it's just going to be run over, uh, you know, operated by people out of control, and they start their own wars. And right now, we're in the midst of of, of people trying to antagonize and provoke Russia into, into a war, military industrial complex. Uh, they, they need the profits. What are they going to do? At the time, people were frightened and the politicians were saying this. If we don't attack them there, they'll attack us here. And I think the opposite is true. I think the fact that uh, we occupy their territories and we have angered even more people now. You still think that? Yeah, I think more people agree with me now than they did back then, because that came up in, in the debate, you know, with Giuliani. And some people said that was the moment I gained more supporters than any other one moment uh, in all those years. Have you ever read about the reasons they attacked us? They, they attack us because we've been over there. We've been bombing Iraq for 10 years. We need to look at what we do from the perspective of what would happen if somebody else did it to us. Wendell, may I make a comment on that? That's really an extraordinary statement. That's an extraordinary statement as someone who lived through the attack of September 11, that we invited the attack because we were attacking Iraq. I don't think I've ever heard that before, and I've heard some pretty absurd explanations for September 11. If we think that we can do what we want around the world and not incite hatred, then we, then we have a problem. They don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. I mean, what would we think if we were, uh, if other foreign countries were doing that to us? He was critical because I was arguing this case that uh, our foreign policy has something to do with it. He said, that means you're blaming um, America. I said, no, you have to realize they're over here because we're over there. And, uh, and nobody listened to what Ben Laden was saying. He supported this whole idea of 9-11. It's because of what we were doing in Iraq, bombing and killing a lot of people, that we had troops in Saudi Arabia, and we supported Israel over the Palestinians. Those were his reasons for it. What, what were we told? What were the American people told? 
Oh, yes, they don't like our freedoms and our prosperity. That, that, those were just lies in order to make excuses for people. Just following up on what you said about Osama bin Laden, here's a quote from him. Expel them in defeat and humiliation from the holy places of Islam. A lot of people were more upset about our being in their country. The people who attacked us weren't upset about American values or democracy. They were most upset that we were in their countries. The point I always made and tried to get them to think about it is what would we do if somebody was in our country doing to what we're doing to them? Uh, you know, even just getting close with vessels and all. Can you imagine how we would have reacted and would react if the Chinese had all their vessels in the Gulf of Mexico or they started, you know, getting on our land like we've been on other land or or uh, putting boycotts on the, these boycotts and taking money out of the bank accounts because we're so powerful. Those are acts of war. Uh, so uh, believe me, the longer I think about this, the more I'm convinced that non-interventionism is the only way to go if you want to live in a free country and try to even come close to doing what the founders had intended. We've got 750 bases in 80 countries. I imagine some people like the money they bring, but a lot of people say, why are all these Americans in my country? Yeah, they, they are, and we're naive enough not to pay any attention because indirectly, there's a lot of money to be made. And you wonder, how do they vote for the uh, F-35 and these uh, aircraft carriers that don't work? And the, the way they work that, it has nothing to do with national security. We live in a modern age, and they're still building World War II-type weaponry. And they're spending billions and billions of dollars, and they're always having uh, problems with it. But you know how they work it is every state gets part of the action, part of the contract. Every state makes it. So then the delegation say, you got to vote for it. We make this, this, this. It's all for the money and the power that pr prompts people to vote for that stuff. To clarify what you said, you, you mean the military contractors cleverly make the airplane in 45 states to get the votes. I don't you know. I think the government does it on purpose. Yeah, in the military industrial complex, it's one and the same. Uh, the, the military industrial complex and their lobbyists are probably, uh, somebody might argue, but uh, I would say it, it's the most deadly pack political action committee and probably the most influential because it's so serious, you know, on, on uh, the propaganda that they pass out along with uh, cooperation by the media. As we talk, the President Biden has sent 3,000 soldiers to Eastern Europe. He justified it saying, as long as Putin acts aggressively, we're gonna make sure we can reassure our NATO allies and Eastern Europe that we're there. <laughs> That's garbage. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Garbage. <laughs> yeah, because it's just justifying all this expenditure. But by what right do we do this and go over there? There's no, no national security. Why do putting troops in places which could be dangerous? That was, that's why we had troops in Saudi Arabia for national security and, and look at what that brought about. So it's, it's always justified for national security and protect our freedoms and, and all that. But uh, that, uh, it, it really makes no sense whatsoever about uh, why we're over there because it has nothing to do with helping Americans, except those who might get a better paycheck. Maybe the wages are better in the airplane industries and building airplanes that we don't need. I imagine President Biden would say, we have to go there just to deter Russia. And if we don't, we're the strongest country, we're inviting them to invade other countries. You know, usually that type of talk, it, it, it's, it's done by the warmongers and the people who are going to make money off it. And most of the time, the people don't ask questions like they did after 9-11. But right now, I think they're more willing to ask questions. Even, even with going into the Middle East after 9-11, there was some polling done about uh, going in, into Iraq. Oh, they were part of 9-11, which wasn't true. So they do this and convince the people, but it has nothing to do with the real reason. They have to get the people's support from that 
So they will make up these stories, but uh, unfortunately it's just more justification for more spending and uh, more profiteering and more danger to the American people. They have to scare the people. Fear is what the, the, the tool is of totalitarians. They've used that for those who think that the only way you can solve the problem of a virus is through totalitarian approaches and make up stories about how dangerous it is. And uh, they do this and uh, the people become fearful. And, and that's why knowledge and truth is the only answer to this. And uh, truth is a rarity in New York. I frequently have made the statement that truth is treasonous in an empire of lies. And, and our government lives by lies. And that's why I think uh, we live in opportune times because anybody who has an inkling of common sense and are looking for the truth is right out there on a platter. There's no reason why if, uh, if some of us who believe this way, if we had a room full of high school kids uh, that just have an open mind, that you couldn't convince them of uh, what I'm talking about when it comes to financing all this big government stuff. Uh, there's an instinct, especially among teenagers who like to be their own guy, you know, their own man. They like to live their own life. And uh, that if we have to promote that and get people to understand they can. But everything that's happening today, they've lost it. And that's why the, the uh, resistance right now is breaking out is so wonderful. You know, we have to head it off with uh, ideas, uh, with better ideas promoted early. And we need more people who are willing to stand up for the truth because the people will accept it if they get to hear the message. In 2007, when we talked, you said, we're going broke. Our currency is being devalued. We're on the road to bankruptcy. And I agreed with you. The deficit then was $9 trillion. Just seemed horrible. But now it's $30 trillion and the stock market goes up. This is like arguing the case and saying, things look better because these guys that came into town, we didn't know how good they were at counterfeiting money. I mean, that really looks like the real stuff. So they pass it out and everybody's happy and they go out and spend and borrow. And it's all malinvestment. They don't use it for productive efforts and things look better. But now things look horrible. Uh, they're worse than they will admit. Interest rates are still low. People can borrow money. Where's the crisis that you and I have been predicting? I think we're in the midst of it. I think we're in the early stages of it. But questions like what you're alluding to have come to me over these 10 years. You know, people say, well, where is it? everything looks all right? How are we? And they would agree with what's happening. We spend too much and we're putting too much money. And it's going to be bad for the dollar. But the, the, the dollar is still holding up. And they asked me, what will you notice when you think something bad is really starting to happen? I said, the dollar will become less valuable. It's going to lose its purchasing power. And you will know it when prices go up at the grocery stores and the price of gasoline will go up. And at the beginning, it won't be so bad. And people say, ah, this will pass. It's transitory. And then it keeps getting worse and worse. And when you get to 30 uh, trillion dollars of debt, uh, Going to 60 is pretty easy. It's been doubled many times over the years. Now, next time it doubles, it's going to be 60. And then there's uh, going to be, uh, you know, uh, just a race for buying stuff. Mises called it the crack up boom. They get to the point where, you know, in part of the boom, when they're printing the money and the money, they, nobody knows it's counterfeit. They go out and spend and things look, look better. But what if they get to the point where they really panic? Uh, and they want to get rid of anything that looks like paper, and they want an asset, then all things go up until the whole thing just collapses, like in, uh, in Venezuela, you know, it's a runaway inflation. But we're, we're just seeing it. So I would tell the people who said those things, those signs that I said a, a year or two or three ago are now happening because uh, the government, this, this always amazes me. Up until now, the government has for 10 years now had the Federal Reserve uh, developed a position of a policy of inflating uh, the currency so fast that prices would go up at 2%. That the value of the dollar would go down 2%. It's a tax. They wanted to do that on purpose. And I used to say, you know, when 2% comes, 
you're not going to see it very long. It's going to come and go. And that's exactly what happened a year or so ago. Nobody remembers that 3% or 4%, 2%. The goal, the purpose of gold was to steal from the people, especially the poor people. And, and all of a sudden it came and went, and now they admit it's seven plus, and it's going to go a lot higher. I was amazed that when you were running for president, you got people excited about the idea and the Fed. I think most Americans have no clue what the Fed does. Well, I, I think more now than they used to. <laughs> but uh, of course, I talked to those people that are very, very interested in it. Uh, but it is necessary. Not that uh, next year uh, I say, well, John, it worked. 51% of the people now understand what we're talking about. That's not going to happen. But if we get more and more people in the right places, uh, the Internet's helpful. As bad as the Internet is, I mean, we put out a lot of information. A lot of libertarian think tanks put out information on the Internet. It's very helpful, but it's also very risky because sometimes if you say, you know, printing money is bad for the economy. Oh, you're gone. <laughs> We're going to cancel you. We don't believe in that. So they're, they're monitors and, and they're uh, canceling people for saying their own thing. But truth wins out in the end, and I think uh, I, I see that, but I'm looking for it and want to see it, I guess, also. People don't know that they just print more money. You've got seven old people who decide they're going to lend the government, this time, $4 trillion in an untested experiment, nothing like it ever done before. We don't know how this is going to end. It's going to end badly. People want money. They want programs. They want the Congress to pass it. The congressmen get reelected. And then the conditions are such that uh, uh, the economy doesn't keep growing because they don't trust the money. And then they have to uh, get the money. And even, uh, even our lenders, yeah, you know, whether it's Japan or China or Russia or these other places, they get disgusted with our foreign policy, and they're not as anxious to buy our debt, and they question how long this can last, so they won't buy it. So that's where the Fed comes in. The, Fed, the Fed's policy right now is schizophrenic, because what they're saying is, well, we're finally going to bite the bullet. We're going to raise interest rates a little bit, but they haven't done any of that yet, but they plan to raise interest rates a little bit at a time. At the same time, they promise they're going to still do QE. They're going to raise interest rates, which is a sign that it's a tighter monetary system. They're going to cause a recession, which is going to end the uh, inflation. Well, that's, that's crazy talk is what it is, uh, because in a free market, you, know, you don't try to lower and ruin the economy. They're trying to do that. They want to ruin the economy so uh, prices will go down. And uh, th then they go back. There's still not enough money. So the government, the Federal Reserve keeps buying it. Where do they get this money to buy it? It's out of a printing press. They created it out of thin air. This is why the founder said only gold and silver should be legal tender. But uh, of course, uh, nobody, nobody cares about that. They, they should, uh, you know, because that's exactly where the problem started. Way back, uh, it really uh, got going during Roosevelt era when the first thing he did was steal the gold from the people and uh, turn gold in from uh, $20 to $35. So the government had a big monetary gain that the people didn't get when they devalued like that. And they've been destroying the value of the money now. And since that time, the dollar has lost 98.9% .9 of its purchasing power. And uh, as inflations go, the inflation and destruction of money accelerate. So it's not gonna slow up. It's not transitory. That's why I bought Bitcoin. But let's move on to some other issues, uh, like immigration. Illegal border crossings hit a new record recently. What should be done? Well, the most important thing is a long time ago, and even now we could do it, is uh, no rewards, no subsidies. If you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it. But there are no penalties, no costs, uh, no reason to become a citizen. And then if they come in and they're criminals themselves or commit crimes, they get better treatment and more exemption than an American citizen. American citizen might get punished, but they have no punishment. 
and they get to live in hotels when other people or who knows what they're doing. There's no welfare should be available. Of course, there shouldn't be any welfare anywhere. Well, most of these people want to work. That is true, too. That's why you could have work programs. They've happened in the past. It's just that when they get to the point where all the economies of the world are so bad, now we're we're worried about our economy, but around the world is actually worse. So they have a tremendous incentive for coming here. But uh, once they know it's a, it's a free ride, uh, it really is a tremendous incentive. There should be work programs, and they've been around for a long time. They have to work for their money, and they can take it back home if they want. But uh, just to pass it out by the trillions of dollars, it's not going to work at all. This is a major problem. I look at it. I try to personalize it because some libertarians believe in open borders. And uh, I sort of lead in that direction. I like free travel and all, but not to the point where free travel means that they can walk into my house and my community is my house. Uh, If you have open borders, does that mean that uh, Pelosi's fence is going to be taken down? No, no, that, that's not it. But they've opened these borders for our, all the poor people who can't defend themselves. Oh, we're going to print the money. We'll take care of them. And they just march on. It's a bomb that is being developed and it's going to explode. As a matter of fact, it's leaking right now. I think in a year from now, I, I predict that the pr- price inflation and the problems we have and the disturbance and the argument between the rich and the poor, the, the elderly and the young people, is going to be much, much worse than it is today. Let's move on to gay rights. You were way ahead of other politicians. Barack Obama said marriage is something sanctified between a man and a woman. But long before that, I ask you, should gays be allowed to marry? Sure, they can do whatever they want, and they can call it whatever they want, just so they don't expect to impose their relationship on somebody else. They can't make me personally accept what they do, but they, they can, uh, uh, gay couples can do whatever they want. Uh, matter of fact, I'd like to see the, all governments out of uh, the marriage question. Well, governments have not gotten out. You still need government permission to marry. There was a time when that wasn't the case. And I think the tradition in the old days, there may be some local authorities, but but the record was usually kept in a Bible, you know, so-and-so married, so-and-so on such and such date. And that, that was the uh, that was the record. Uh, so no, the government should be out of it. Uh, you can have a personal opinion about what you think, but uh, the people who want to live a gay life, they have no right to impose their standards on us and force it into our home or business if we don't want it. Uh, and uh, uh, they should be able to uh, live their lives and uh, there should be no prohibition. Libertarian is a simple, no force and no prohibition. You can't force people to do anything. Everything should be voluntary. Speaking of prohibition, uh... Years ago, you were unusual because you were against the drug war. Almost no other politicians were. And now, 15 years later, marijuana's legal most places, or partly progress. Yeah, I think so. I think it cuts down on the violence. If they can't make a lot of money on illegal marijuana, they'll, make it, they'll look for something that is illegal. Just think of uh, alcohol. It's legal, but how many... People are out making uh, are drug dealers to get uh, to buy beer. It doesn't happen anymore. So you get rid of the violence. But uh, for it to really work, of course, it depends on what type of a society we have. If we have people that uh, are insecure enough that they are totally dependent on drugs, it's going to be a big problem. But I still don't want to trouble the government <laughs> claiming they know how to solve the problem. It should be done. There have been groups that have been voluntary and private and churches and different people that would help help addiction. But the trouble is, is uh, governments uh, don't do a good job. And I think the history and the story about the prohibition of alcohol is a pretty strong history. But I, what I get a charge out of is when they pass the amendment to prohibit uh, uh, use of alcohol, to stop the use of alcohol, they wrote a constitutional amendment. That's how much they thought that it should be. Now, nothing, uh, you know, now people don't need any laws. They just just change a regulation and they can do things. They wouldn't think of changing the constitution uh, in order to do that. Of course, they wrote it in the constitution, it didn't work, so they took it out. 
but that still wasn't the problem. The problem is, is the uh, social and moral fiber of a community on how much drinking they're, they're going to do. Denver and Seattle legalized uh, psychedelics. Good thing. Everything should be legal. If it hurts them, that's their business. And people have to take their own risk. And once again, what, what are you doing? Uh, are you forcing it on somebody that is not able to make their own choices? And maybe forcing drugs or any drugs, beer or anything, on a 12-year-old? Uh, no, I don't like that. But uh, ba ba basically, the principle is the government can't protect us from ourselves. And uh, that was one of the principles they violated with all the nonsense that has gone on with COVID. The government could protect us. We just write a lot of regulations. You know, that uh, that was uh, read a lot of authoritarians that loved being able to write regulations like this. Let's talk about that, because on your TV show, which you do every day, you talk a lot about COVID regulations and how the government's gone too far. What are the worst things government did? <laughs> well, I can't think of anything good that they did. <laughs> uh, I don't even believe the CDC should exist. Uh, so all those regulations, this, this whole idea that a Dr. Fauci, the highest paid individual in Washington ever, uh, writing all these regulations, it's just, just the worst form of authoritarianism. So what, what uh, you, you said, what, what good did they do? Well, uh, I think everything they did was detrimental, but even if it, it didn't have an immediate bad effect, it was detrimental because it was it violates the principles of voluntarism and, and personal choice. That's the way things would be. And even under those circumstances, mistakes will be made. But uh, if the mistakes are made, if, if it's an individual, you're uh, hurting yourself. But this whole idea, uh, so much of what we do is the we've assumed that the government should protect us from ourselves. Uh, John, what would happen if we didn't uh, have uh, helmets and you went on your motorcycle or something? How horrible that would be. And they said, yeah, but what if you landed in the hospital and the government would have to pay your hospital bills? Well, the hospital should be paying your hospital bills. <laughs> you know, it just goes on and on. So I think voluntarism is a great term. Is a mandate ever justified, say a vaccine mandate? I don't think so. What if there were an airborne Ebola and it was spreading quickly? That doesn't invite the United Nations to come in and spread the, the country or invite the United States to go to India and spray India. No, but it, most people would say it invites our government to say, Dr. Paul, you've got to vaccinate yourself and your children because this disease is killing people. They thought that's what they were doing and look at the tragedy of what happened. But you're saying that you've already determined that this was the most deadly thing in the world and there were no other options. I'm assuming that. I don't think the government should make mandates on personal behavior. It should be done through education and persuasion and families and, and how, how people are influenced on how they take care of themselves. So it's the morality of the people that will be determined whether any anything is done to prevent those kind of problems. So I think a mandate is inefficient. And sometimes it makes a mistake. And you're, you're suggesting, well, if I, if I don't have a mandate on me, I might not do something and somebody might suffer. Well, what if the mandate is wrong? <laughs> That's the problem. And then it incorporates hundreds, thousands, millions of people. And that's more or less what has happened, you know, with this treatment on COVID. Are you vaccinated? Oh, oh I, I might be. Maybe if I had the disease, I believe in natural immunity. But, but it became, now you talk about mandates. You, a doctor wasn't even allowed to talk about natural immunity <laughs> or, you, or you would be banned. You would be lose your job as a physician. It turned it into insanity. So uh, no, I, um, I had a polio shot, you know, because I, I was raised uh, in the era of polio and uh, nobody told me I had to have it. My mother worked real hard in the March of Dimes and, don and raised a lot of money for private research. And the vaccine came out and she was a participant in the distribution of polio vaccine. And, uh, and it was natural for us to uh, think about it. And, and I was always amazed that I had friends that uh, died from polio during the 50s. You're old. You might die from COVID. Uh, 
well, who, who knows? But uh, you might die from a car accident, but you don't ban automobiles. We've talked a lot about bad news here. Is there any good news? Yeah, I think there's good news all the time. If I go to the college campus, I get a good audience, which many times I can. I'll talk about 45 minutes about what you and I just have talked about. Of all the problems, the debt and the wars and, and a, a, a violation of our liberties. And But the last 15 minutes, I talk about, you know, the principles of liberty. It makes sense. It's nonviolent. People can't hurt people. And uh, and just, you know, pump them up about the solutions. The solutions are so much easier. But the only thing is, is you have to be responsible for all your actions. You, you can't hurt other people. And uh, I... I and so often, which was always amazing to me, because I spent time trying to get their attention. And I had so many would come up after me and they, they said, Dr. Paul, what I like about you is you're such an optimist. And they were serious. Well, there is good news from the private sector. You've got people like Elon Musk ignoring regulations and outperforming NASA. You've got a companies that made a vaccine in months. Can the private sector overcome our government? If the government just got out of their way and permitted more of it, but right but now- But I was thinking maybe the private sector can produce so much wealth, so many good things, they can stay ahead of the growth of destructive government. I think so. And that's why I would say that the FDA and the CDC and, and subsidies to drug industry should be removed uh, because they uh, would be on their own and, and the responsibility would be built if they didn't get government guarantees that nobody could sue them, you know, turn that over to the market. I think you'd have better drugs. I think they would be cheaper, uh, uh, you, you know, but when the government gets involved, it doesn't go well. You still go to the gym twice a day? I do a lot of exercise twice a day. I've, I don't like to do much stuff indoors. I, I do bicycling outdoors, and I also do a lot of walking. And uh, sometimes I don't get in twice a day. And some days, if it's uh, if we get a bad winter spell here in Texas and, and the temperature goes down to 30 and it's raining, I might miss a session. But no, it's a habit for me. I consider it a good habit. I feel better. I believe it's more for psychological reason, even though it helps you physically. I think that I benefit psychologically. Besides, most of the time when I finish my walk, I go into the house and I'm writing something down that I thought of. I, I don't want to forget that item. So, uh, yes, I keep up with that. I think it's great. And it must be working because for an 86-year-old man, you look very good. And obviously, you've got tremendous energy. Well, thank you. It's nice uh, being with you. And I was delighted to come on your program. Thank you, Dr. Ron Paul. Thanks for watching. I hope you'll share and like this video. That'll help us make more. And if you really want to help us make more, click that button.